This is NET, National Educational Television. This is PBS, the public broadcasting service. This is PBS. 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 Hello and welcome to This is Public Broadcasting. I'm your host, Captain Rutledge. You know, folks, <clears throat> the world today seems absolutely bonkers. You know, there are Twitter bots that make our anger sky high. And there are fools and there are idiots currently in charge of everything. It's depressing and it's senseless. And that's why. I like Chinese. I like Chinese. They come from a long way overseas But they're cute and they're cuddly and they're ready to please In all seriousness, Chinese culture has endured through thousands of years and countless ruling dynasties in one form or another, producing globally influential forms of calligraphy, sculpture, dance, ceramics, martial arts, fashion, and those tiny laughing Buddha statues you sometimes find in Chinese grocery stores. And that's not to mention the food which it seems is even more popular in the United States than it is in China. Speaking of which, it's time for my dinner. Boy, a sip of tea. All of this lovely food reminds me of a certain magistrate who lived in the China of the century past who kept cats that would use their tails to write for him, and one particular cat who fell into a pot of ink. So, while I enjoy my dinner, let me tell you about Sagwa, the Chinese Siamese cat. Created by Amy Tan, who is best known for writing The Joy Luck Club, the series follows the adventures of Sagwa, a young Siamese cat and her friends and family, who live in the palace of their magistrate owner, practicing calligraphy with their tails, going on adventures, and learning the importance of family. The show premiered on PBS Kids in 2001 and ran for 40 episodes. Sagwa was produced by Cinegroup and the Sesame Workshop, and funding for the series was provided by Kellogg's and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Excuse me. Uh, from its premiere, Sagwa was a ratings hit on several PBS stations. What went into the show's popularity, though? Well, let's find out after I finish this dumpling. Amy Tan's original book tells a story about a foolish magistrate who only made laws that benefited just himself and his family. One day, though, one of his cats fell into an ink pot and inadvertently changed one of the new laws against public singing. The new law made it compulsory for everybody to sing from sunrise to sunset. Before the magistrate figured out what went wrong, he found that his people were happy for the new law and looked on him as a kind ruler. Eventually, Sagwa was revealed as a culprit, and out of gratitude, the magistrate had all of his cats given the ink smudge on Sagwa's face. And that's why Chinese Siamese cats look that particular way. Peas? Mushrooms, bamboo. Oh, um. Fun fact, uh, Amy Tan's inspiration for Sagwa happened after she learned that her 17-year-old cat had only a month left to live. One night, she had a dream of China and wrote a story that we know and love. She shared it with her family, and once she had it published, it became a bestseller. And don't worry, folks, her cat lived to the ripe old age of 21. Wow, that is one of the best stories Elmo has ever heard, Amy! It wasn't long until PBS began to show interest in adapting Sagwa into a TV series. Amy Tan and Gretchen Shields, who illustrated the original book, served as creative consultants for the series. Their story ideas were then transformed into teleplays, by a team of writers led by story editors Alan Silberberg and David Wong. Gretchen Shields' original illustrations were then adapted to the screen by character designers Jelaine Barb and Katie Morrow, and the final animations were directed by Joseph Jakes. 
a number of changes were made in adapting the book to TV. Instead of taking place in ancient China like in the book, the TV show takes place during the late Qing Dynasty, around the turn of the century. In the book, Sagwa was male. In the series, Sagwa is female. What's more, the foolish magistrate has a wife named Tai Tai and three daughters, Bado, Lukdo, and Huangdo, along with the palace cook and the official reader. Sagwa has a family too, including her older brother Donggua, little sister Shigua, and parrots Baba and Mama, along with their best friend Fufu the Bat. What's more, the whole cat family are now the magistrate's official stenographers. Voice acting for the series includes Holly Gautier Frankel as Sagwa, Oliver Granger as Dongwa, Jesse Vinay as Shigua, Arthur Holden as Baba, Ellen David as Mama, Rick Jones as Fufu, Hiro Kanagawa as the Magistrate, Kairi Ladoyo as Tai Tai, Kathy Tsoi, Liana Dachi, and Rosa Yi as the Daughters, Raugi Yu as the Cook, and Russell Yuen as the Reader. The humans are voiced by Asian voice actors, and yet the animals are not. I wonder if Hollywood took inspiration from this at one point. Story-wise, a lot of the episodes have moral undertones, as expected from PBS Kids programs at this point. But for the most part, these morals deal with togetherness and family, and are interspersed with tidbits of traditional Chinese culture, including painting, ceramics, martial arts, calligraphy, holidays, and the magistrate's personal favorite, food. <laughs> Well, who can blame him? I mean, I myself am a sucker for hoist and beef. The series' first episode retells the plot from Amy Tan's original book. Other episodes are either morality stories, cultural stories, or repurposed folk tales. One such morality story is the birds, the bees, and the silkworms. Tai Tai is planning a banquet, but gets disgusted by the local birds, bees, and silkworms around the palace, and orders them all driven out. However, she soon realizes her mistake when the banquet is ruined anyway. It shows how everything in nature is connected, and removing one single aspect can upset the delicate balance. Another great example here is the episode Master of Mistakes. The magistrate's daughters fail in their hobbies and give up on them, so the magistrate brings in a traveling tutor to help the daughters learn. In the end, the tutor doesn't teach the daughters anything, but rather helps them to learn from their past mistakes. Is it a cultural story you want? Well, how about Bado and the Lantern Festival? This episode has the Magistrate's daughters going out during the yearly Lantern Festival held at the end of the Lunar New Year. Sagwa and Bado get lost, but on their way back they come across an old woman in the streets who shows them the true meaning of the New Year's festivities. By the light of the moon has the Magistrate's family and cats preparing for the Festival of the Harvest Moon. Both episodes shine a light on Chinese holidays and traditions and the importance of togetherness and family in both holidays. Then come the folktale episodes. A catfish tale tells the story of how the catfish came into being, and the zodiac zoo tells why the zodiac signs are in their specific order. And for those of you who are curious, 2021 is the year of the ox. The delicious, tender ox. And then there are the episodes that are my personal favorites. The competition has the magistrate and one of his rivals showing off their family's calligraphy skills in a contest. But their cheating during the contest results in Sagwa and the rival magistrate's daughter being disqualified. A particularly heartwarming episode is Chashu Bow Wow. Sagwa's uncle and aunt visit with their adoptive stun, a puppy named Chashu. Tai Tai's sleeve dogs torment the poor dog, but Dongwa helps him out to fit in with other dogs. Fufu himself gets some good episodes to his name, my favorite in particular is Sagwa's Lucky Bat, where Fufu gets caught by Tai Tai and is kept in a cage as the palace's lucky bat. Sagwa helps him escape, much to Tai Tai's dismay, but Tai Tai soon learns that her lucky bat is better off being allowed to fly free. I was in the right age group when Sagwa first aired on PBS Kids, and it was one of my favorite programs to watch on there. Back one year, my aunt sent me a Sagwa birthday card with a Tangram puzzle attached to it. Looking back now, though, I do have some issues. Amy Tan has had criticism in the past for character stereotypes in her stories. 
Amy Tan herself was born in California, her parents leaving China to escape the Communist Revolution. As a result, most of her understanding of Chinese culture is second-hand, and some of her works pander to the imagination of foolish Westerners, like myself. Sagwa definitely embodies some of these criticisms. Sure, it's not as bad as some portrayals of Chinese in popular media, but it's not perfect either. The voice acting for the most part in the series is okay. I absolutely love Kairi Ladoyo as Tai Tai and Hiro Kanagawa as the Magistrate. I do have issues though with Oliver Granger's performance as Dongwa though. His voice just sounds overly whiny. I don't feel like playing anymore. Oh my gosh! We have to finish the scrolls! She made us promise! But you just got here. I'm sorry, Mama, but sometimes she asks the silliest questions. <laughs> Animation-wise, there can be some awkward frames at times, but the animation itself isn't too terrible. My biggest complaint, though, is how the series was cut short. Firstly, merchandise for the show was almost non-existent. Secondly, the September 11th attacks. PBS Broadcasting had difficulty competing with news coverage at the time, and a number of PBS Kids shows received the axe. According to some rumors, the Sesame Workshop had to free up funds for Sesame Street, and Sagwa was sadly let go. It continued airing as reruns on most PBS stations until the mid-2000s, but essentially it left the airwaves in 2008. I bet most of you watching are wondering about watching a marathon of all 40 episodes of Sagwa. Well, um... The sad thing is that many of these Sagwa episodes have never had home media releases, and several copies of unreleased episodes online are either in poor quality or dubbed in a foreign language. The Lost Media Wiki has a list of found episodes if you're curious, but sadly it's difficult to rewatch some of these episodes if you want to relive some childhood memories. <sighs> Shame that it's so difficult to watch some of these episodes, but say la vie. Maybe one day there will be a full DVD release of all these episodes, and new generations of children will fall in love with these characters and stories. But until that time, let's be thankful for what's been released online and for the memories that have been rekindled. And I think there's no better way to end a Chinese dinner than with that most American of delicacies, the fortune cookie. Let's see what my fortune is. Okay. You will win success in whatever you attempt. Hmm, that's very motivating. Hold on, there's something else in here. Ah, it's the newest station for the PBS member station spotlight. <laughs> Excuse me. So, it looks like we're heading down to the south with Arkansas Educational TV Network. Arkansas PBS had its beginnings with the Arkansas Educational Television Commission in 1961. The network's flagship station, KETS Little Rock, signed onto the airwaves in 1966 as part of the new Arkansas Educational Television Network. At first, KETS only showed black and white broadcasts through its association with National Educational Television, but by 1972 had moved on to color broadcasts from the Public Broadcasting Service. Through the 70s and 80s, AETN expanded its reach throughout the state of Arkansas, and in, and in addition to PBS programming, showed programming for public schools, college telecourses, and adult GED courses, even implementing a distance learning service in the 1990s. In 2020, AETN officially changed its name to Arkansas PBS in recognition of PBS's 50th anniversary. In 2019, AETN became one of a number of PBS networks that refused to air the Arthur episode Mr. Ratburn and the Special Someone due to its portrayal of same-sex marriage. However, the network later relented and decided to air the episode on an alternate channel. Today, Arkansas PBS offers programming to almost every reach of Arkansas, along with bordering states. 
Annually, Arkansas PBS produces over 100 hours of state-related programming, including Arkansas Week, Cooking on the Wild Side, El Latino, Paint with Kevin, Exploring Arkansas, and Agri Arkansas, along with the children's series Blueberry's Clubhouse and The Gobbledy Book. If you're in the state of Arkansas, you can tune in to Arkansas PBS on these stations with Create on the Dot 2 channel, PBS Kids on the Dot 3 channel, and World on the Dot 4 channel. Well, thank you to everyone for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, feel free to like, subscribe, and share. Leave a comment, ring the bell, follow on Twitter, and also don't forget to support your local PBS stations so more programming related to Sagwa can find its way to your PBS screens. And until next time, I'm Captain Rutledge. Soijin. May I be excused, please? Dongwa? Dongwa?